So in the last lecture, we were looking at arrays um, and their relationship to pointers. So this was the slide that we left off on. Um, I just want to quickly go over this slide one more time. Well, let's see, this one. Let's do uh, this one one more time. Right? So the first line of this little main method, or sorry, main function, uh, there's actually two, so there's two, um, what's the best way to describe this? There's two strings in this example. Okay? So string number one is the string literal sysc220. Right? So somewhere in memory when you write this, right, uh, the C compiler will allocate a chunk of memory and put the letters CISC220 slash zero in that memory. Right? So that's the memory, that's the string that represents the literal. Right? So that gets stuck somewhere in memory and that becomes unwritable to you. Because it's a string literal, you can't change it. Right? So there's no way for you to actually go in and change the characters of the literal. However, in this example, we've also got an array str. Right? So the array str I've drawn on the board up here. Right? So that array, you can change those characters. Right? So when you write str square brackets equals the string literal, C copies the characters from the string literal into the array. Right? And so you can see that array, it has indexes uh, 0 through 7. Right? So the length of the array is 8. Right? 7 characters in the string, right? sysc220, and then one more character for the null terminator, right? for the slash 0 or the 0 character. Right? So every proper C string is supposed to look like that. Now there's nothing from stopping you from making a string of length, uh, an array of character of length 7 and not putting in the null terminator. Right? So you can have an array of length 7 whose characters are just sysc220. Right, with no null terminator. If you try to use that array and pass it to one of the functions that expect a standard C string, you'll probably end up with some sort of error because the null terminator is missing. Right? And so this null terminator is here. You might wonder why the null terminator is here. Right? So why does C require a terminator on this string? Right? It's because there's no, there's no proper string type. Right? So there's no type where you can actually ask that type for the length of the string. Right, so in other words, the length of the string is not carried around. Like, that information is not available uh, to the compiler or the C runtime. Right? All that C knows is that there's some array. Can you please stop talking? Excuse me. All that C knows is that there's an array somewhere and it has characters in it. Right? So it needs that null terminator to indicate that's the end of the string. Right? You can make an array that's much longer than 8. Right? So you can make an array of length 100 and you can put the characters sys220 backslash zero in that array, and C will think that's a string of length seven still, right? even though the array has much more capacity. Okay, so remember that the name of the array is the same as a pointer to the first element in the array. Right? So in this example here, where I'm making a pointer P, right, and I'm saying that's equal to str, then P is that pointer. Right? So P is the pointer that points to the first character in the string. Right? When you write P plus 1, that just goes to the next element in the array. Right? So that's P. P plus 1 goes to, points at the I. Right? So that would be P plus 1. Right? And that would be P plus 6. Right, and we'll see more examples of pointer arithmetic later in the course. Right, you can subtract pointers. It turns out you can write P++. Plus plus, that moves the pointer one to the right. You can write P++. Minus minus, that moves the pointer one position to the left, and so on and so forth. Right. You can use the pointer um, to access or to change elements of the array. Right. So when you have an array, you can either use the square brackets, which you should probably normally do, Right, or you can choose to use a uh, pointer uh, notation instead. Right. All right, now remember there's no, bound, there's no index checking in C. Right? So it turns out C doesn't even know what the length of an array is uh, in most cases. And you'll see this later on when we talk about passing uh, arrays to functions. Right? So in most cases, C doesn't know how big an array actually is. Uh, so there's no way it can actually do any index bounds checking. Right. So if you try to use an illegal uh, or a, an index that's not valid, right, what C actually does is it actually tries to access that memory location. So if I wrote, uh, that's str. So if I wrote str uh, 8, right, 
C will actually try to access whatever memory is sitting here. Okay. Um, and depending on what's sitting there, uh, you may end up with something unusual. Right? If you're lucky, your program crashes when you access something that's not, uh, when you access something that's not actually in the array. But that doesn't always happen. Right? Uh, and so because there's no index bounds, there's no index checking, uh, there's no, uh, you, you can't detect the problem at compile time. Right? So the compiler can't help you. And then at runtime, well, the runtime doesn't really help you either. Right? If the program crashes, it crashes, and it doesn't tell you why it crashed. It just says something like, uh, but, but, but this is array six, I think. Six or seven, yeah, six. So there's the example. All you get is this message segmentation fault, right? You don't get this nice, nicely formatted exception message that you get in Java or Python, where it tells you the line number on which this happened and the reason why the index is not valid, right? This just says, this just barfs and that's it. You have no idea what happened, right? So now you have to go in and try to figure out what did you do wrong. Okay, so here's an example um, where you try to access an element that's way out of bounds, right? So this is accessing element, what is that, 100,001 in that string, which clearly doesn't exist, right? When we run this problem, uh, when we ran this program, we got the message. Oh, no, not that one, sorry. Uh, which one is this one, cat? Uh, not that one. Not that one? Oh wait, so that one does something interesting. Where is that one? Hang on, sorry. Array seven, there's seven. Oh, two, three, oh, so right. Okay, there we go. That's what you're supposed to get. Okay, so you end up with this funny message if you're using GCC. Uh, it says stack smashing detected, terminated. Uh, so the compiler in this case has actually instrumented your code with some extra stuff to detect cases where you are accessing uh, an element of this particular array um, incorrectly. Now it turns out you can turn that off. Right? Now you wouldn't normally do this, but you can. Right? So if I use this flag, no stack protector, uh, and compile the program. So, sorry, um, minus f no stack protector. Right. So the program compiles just fine, uh, and when you run it, something odd happens. Right. So it prints out sys220 and then the number 63. Right. So when you look at the program, so what does it do? So it prints out the string, right, which is up here. So that prints out sys220, which is good, right? Now this line here does exactly what I, to what I described over here. I'm gonna try to access that element of the array, right, using p8 in this case, right? So that's one past the end of that array, right? And I'm going to set that to the question mark Right? And notice that this works, right? I can actually change that, pro uh, uh, the, the program actually runs, right? And it prints out the number 63, which is weird because I'm printing out X, right? We're actually trying to print out X, oops, sorry. We're actually trying to print out X here, but X is 100, and there's nothing in here that changes the value 100, right? The thing that causes the value of 100 to change is that line right there. Right? When I illegally access the array, go one past the end, and change the memory that's sitting there. Right? So I've actually written into the eight bits here, the qu whatever corresponds to the question mark. Right? And it turns out doing that overwrites part of the int x. Right? So I've blown over data that doesn't belong to uh, this array str. Um, and this is exactly what happens in what's called a buffer overrun bug. Um, which you might have heard of. Um, if you've ever heard of any security issues happening in code, um, buffer overruns are one of the most common uh, errors that cause programs to uh, have security flaws in them. Right? If you can obtain a pointer to something in memory and then move it somewhere else, there's a chance that you can overwrite uh, something interesting. Right? 
Uh, and that turns out to be a huge security flaw in a lot of existing C programs. Okay. So can you create multi-dimensional arrays in C? The answer is yes, right? So just like in Java where you can have a two-dimensional array, you can have a two-dimensional array in C, or a three-dimensional, or a four-dimensional, or an n-dimensional array if you like. Right? So if you wanted to make the array or the matrix uh, with these six elements in it, uh, then what you would do is you would declare an array of int in this case, right, uh, in the following way, right? So you'd say that A is the array two and three, right? So two rows, three columns, right? Um, and so what this really is, is it's actually an array of arrays. So that thing there uh, is actually an array of int arrays, right? The first array uh, is that one right there. So it's 10, 11, 12, right? So that's actually A0, right? A0 is the array 10, 11, 12. A1 is the array 13, 14, 15. Right, so this thing here is actually an array of two int arrays, right? And that's what that notation there means. It actually means the same thing in Java. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Right. Okay. So uh, notice that that thing there is an array of two elements, each of which is an array of three elements, right? So a zero is actually an array of three ints, and a one is an array of three ints. Uh, it turns out that's what happens in Java as well. But in Java, you can have uh, the rows can have unequal lengths. Uh, in C, you can't do that. Right? So in po it's possible in Java to make an array where that would have one element in it, the next one would have 20 elements in it, the next one would have three elements in it, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, in C, you don't have that flexibility, uh, at least not using this notation here. Okay, so if you want to print out the elements of the array, well, you can do it the exact same way that you would do it in uh, Java, right? You'd use a nested pair of loops, right? So the first, or the, in, I'm, the way I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna loop over the rows, right? So the outer loop, uh, where the, um, loop in, uh, the loop variable is i, so that's over the rows, right? There's two rows in this array, so i is less than two, right? The inner loop is gonna loop over the columns, right? So uh, j is less than three, because there's three columns. Right. Each time in the inner loop, I'm going to print out the array element at a i j. Right. Uh, and then every time I finish with a row, I'm going to print out a new line. Right. So in this case, if you run this program, this is array 8. Right. You get 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Right. Exactly what you would hope to get in this case. But there's more. Right. So it turns out that when you create a multidimensional array, uh, the C standard says that the multi, the elements of the array are, uh, the elements are stored contiguously in memory. So in other words, this thing here has six ints in it, right? Two, uh, it has two arrays of size three, right? So a total of six ints. So it turns out when the C allocates memory for this thing, it allocates memory for six ints and it sticks them all beside one another, right? So row one comes first and then the elements of row two come next. So you can actually treat this thing as though it were an array of size six, right? So what you can do is that you can get a pointer to the first element of the array, right? So I can get a pointer to the 10, right? Uh, and then I can use that pointer, moving it one element at a time to get all the elements of the array, right? And so uh, if you ever see the, this language here that C uses row major order to store the elements, that's what it means, right? It stores the elements of each row uh, one at a time, right? So row one first, and then row two second, and then row three third, and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, some languages are column major, so they store column one first, then column two, then column three, right? You guys probably won't see any of those um, unless you happen to program in Fortran at some point in time, right? So I can get a pointer, right? I want to make, I want a pointer to the first element of the array, right? So that's, uh, so A00, zero zero, that's the first element of the array. Right? If I take the address of that, that gives me a pointer to the first element. Right? So I can set that, uh, I can take that address and store that in a pointer to an int. Right? So p points at the first element of the array. Then I can just loop six times, right? printing out uh, whatever p plus i um, points at. Right? So you can also use a one dimensional, uh, a, one, a single loop in this case to iterate over all the elements of the array. 
Uh, in this case, you get something slightly different printed out because it prints out all the elements uh, in one row. Right? You can, of course, change the program so that it prints a new line here if you wanted to. Right? Uh, it's not that hard to do. Right? Oh, wait. So the, uh, the actual program that I have is slightly different. Uh, so let's just show you that. So Ray 8. Okay, uh, where's Ray 9? Okay, so uh, on the slide, we've got the address of A00, right? But there's another way to get a pointer to that first element of the array, right? And that is you can write the following, right? So remember A0, that's the first array, right? That's the array 10, 11, 12. So A0 is actually that array. So that means the name A0 is synonymous to the first, uh, is it synonymous to a pointer to the first element of that array, right? So that's the other way that you can get that pointer. Right? Okay, uh, we're gonna come back to pointers later on uh, in the course, so we're gonna look at them again. Uh, so right now we're only looking at the simplest use case of a pointer. Uh, later on you'll see more complicated use cases. Oops, sorry. Uh, any questions before we move on? All right. So now we're going to go back and look at the arithmetic types a little bit more in depth. Right? So you know the, uh, so the, these are basically, uh, we're talking about the ints today. Right? So remember that the ints in uh, C, there's a few more of them than there are in Java. They come in unsigned and signed varieties. Uh, and that's what we're going to pay attention to today. Um, the, t the integer types behave more or less the same as uh, they do in Java. Right? The only difference besides the different names of the types uh, is that the exact sizes of the different types is not specified in C. Right? Only the ordering of the, uh, only the size ordering is specified. Right? So short has to be at least, sorry, short is smaller than or equal to the size of int, the size of int is smaller than or equal to the size of long, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So the ordering of the sizes is, 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 is specified, but the actual sizes are not. If you actually wanna know what the, uh, what the various constants are related to the integer types, you can look in this header called limits.h. So in that header, it'll tell you things like uh, the size of the various types for your architecture. Right? It'll tell you things like the minimum value of say int for your architecture. It'll tell you the maximum value for say short for your architecture um, and so on and so forth. All right, so C, whoa, oh, sorry. Uh, C's got these things called unsigned integers. What's going on here? C, no. Sorry, something, something funny is going on. Okay. Oh, I see. Is that actually, oh, okay, so it's showing up over there. All right. All right, so there's the unsigned integers. So the unsigned integers start at zero, right? So there's no negative values in the unsigned integers, right? Now, an unsigned int uh, takes up the same amount of memory as a plain old int, right? So unsigned int and signed ints, they occupy the same amount of memory, right? Uh, so if you think about that for a second, there's no negative values in the unsigned ints. So it kind of makes sense that the maximum value of unsigned int is bigger than the maximum value of int. Right, because you don't have to account for all the negative values. So you get more positive values, and that's exactly what happens. Right? Now you should at some point have been told uh, what the binary representation of an unsigned number is. Right? So at some point you should have seen a picture of something like this. Right? So a binary number is just a number written in zeros and ones. Right? The rightmost binary digit to get its decimal value, right? you just take the digit, one or zero, and multiply it by two to the zero, right? The next digit you multiply by two to the one, right? The next digit you multiply by two to the two, and so on, right? To get the decimal value, you just add everything up, 
and get the value of the number. Right? So you should know that. Uh, you should know that by this point in time. Right? So the binary number 01101011 has the decimal value uh, 107 right? in unsigned uh, binary. Right? So for, unsigned, uh, for an unsigned integer. Okay, now if you actually wanted to write down a binary number for some reason, so you want to write down a number in zeros and ones for some reason, in C there's no standard way to do that. Right? Uh, now GCC gives you a way to do that. So GCC has this funny extension where you can write down, oh I know what's going on, okay sorry, do I, can I, no I can't do that, where you can write down uh, a binary number using the prefix 0b. Right, so notice here, car C equals zero B and then a bunch of ones and zeros. Right, so that's a compiler specific extension. You can't do that um, in standard C. Right, but if your compiler supports that, you can in fact write this. Right? Now to print out that unsigned car value, uh, you've got a couple of ways to do it. Right, so I can treat that unsigned car value as though it were a regular car. So that's what percent C does. So percent %c will interpret that character as though it were a regular car and it will print out the symbol corresponding to that car. Right? So percent %c is the thing you want to do if you want to treat cars as though they were actual uh, liter literal characters. Right? So if I print that out, this is a uh, u-car, right? Yeah. Okay. So if we print that out. We get the letter K, right? So the number 107 actually corresponds to the letter K uh, when you interpret the car as a literal car, right? And not as an actual number, right? The actual number though is 107, right? Um, and if you were paying really close attention, wait, can you see that when I do that? Oh, I'm sorry, how come no one said anything? Sorry, I've been doing all this in, uh, okay, hang on. I think it's because I flipped this earlier. Okay, sorry. Okay, let's try that again. So, all right, so we see that now. And then we can do this. Does that work? And that's not working now. Okay. So when you print out, uh, you, when you print out the character value using percent %c, that gives you the literal character value, right? So you get the k in this case, right? If you print out the number using percent %d, so actually give me the decimal value, uh, sorry, treat the C as though it were an integer value, right? Then you get the number 107. Right? Uh, and if you were paying really close attention, and if you could have actually seen the screen when I was showing it to you, you would have realized that that number there, right, that binary number there is the exact same as the binary number that's on the slides, right? Uh, just a second here, see if I can't get this to come up again. It's not, uh, yeah, it's barfing now. Does this work? Okay, there we go, right? So the binary number that's in the program uh, is the same as the binary number that's in the slide, right? Zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, right? Zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. Okay, if you happen to have an n-bit unsigned binary number, you can actually calculate what the maximum value, the maximum decimal value is, right? It turns out that's two to the n minus one, uh, this is um, a straightforward proof by induction if you wanted to do it. Okay, now what about the signed integer values? Right. So the signed integer values have values that range from some most negative value up to some most positive value. Right. Now, everything's binary, right? So your digits, every digit of your binary number can have one of two different values. Right. So for say an eight bit number, Right? There are a total of two to the eight different binary values, right? Makes sense, right? Well, that means there's an even number of binary values for any number of bits, right? So if you were to write down, say, suppose you have a two-digit binary number, right? Two, 
Yeah, sure, two. So I can represent the numbers minus two, minus one, zero, and one, right? There's an even number of, of, uh, of actual digit, of actual numbers that you can represent, right? There's more, there's always more negative values than there are positive values, right? Because it, you have to represent zero somehow. So there's always more negative. So the most negative value, right? Its magnitude is always bigger than the most positive value. Right? Now, of course, you could choose a different representation where you go from minus one up to two. In that case, the most positive value becomes bigger, the magnitude of the most positive value becomes bigger than the magnitude of the most negative value. Right? But it turns out that's how it works. Right? Okay, now the C standard is really weird because it doesn't actually say how should these binary numbers, how should these signed integers be represented on, on the computer, right? So nowhere is that spelled out in the standard. Um, and it turns out there's a, at least three different ways that you can do this, right? So there's something called one's complement, there's something called two's complement, and there's something called, I can't remember now, signed, signed bit or something like that, right? Almost every modern computer uses two's complement. Uh, so I, that's what I'm gonna show you today. Uh, I think C23 says that it will only support two's complement. Um, but as far as the standard is written right now, your computer can use any representation of the unsigned integer, of the, sorry, of the signed integer. Okay, so what does two's complement look like? So it's still a binary number, right? So everything's still zeros and ones, right? So here's the exact same binary number that we had before. The way two's complement works is, instead of multiplying that the leftmost digit by, in this case, two to the seven, you multiply it by negative two to the seven, right? So if this value is a one, you have a negative number. If that value is not a one, you have a positive number or uh, zero, right? So that the uh, sign on the most significant bit is negative, right? So that number there, it's still 107, right? Because the first digit's zero. As soon as I flip that bit, so I've only changed that one bit, Right? Now the weight of that bit becomes minus 128. Right? So the, the total value of this binary number becomes minus 21. Right? So two's complement, that uh, the most significant bit determines the sign of the number. Right? If it's one, it's negative. If it's zero, it's uh, non-negative. Okay, so given that this is the way it works, Right? What is the most positive number that you can have if you have an 8-bit signed value? Right? Well, that can't be 1, because right? if it's 1, it's negative. Right? So the most positive value occurs when all of the other digits are 1. Right? So 0, and then all 1s. So that's your most positive value. Right? Sum that all up, that's 127. Right? What's the most negative value? Well, the first digit has to be a one, right? Because it's negative. Now remember, all the other digits, they contribute a positive amount to the total value. So the most negative number then, these must all be zero, right? Otherwise, uh, it'll be one minus 128 plus some positive value, right? So that's the most negative number, right? Which is minus 128. Notice 128 is bigger than 127. So the range of the unsigned, of the signed integer values is asymmetric about zero, right? There's always more negative value, there's always one more negative value than there are positive values. Okay, so how, can you convert between the two's complement represent, uh, sorry, for any, oh. So if I give you any integer value x, the two's complement representation of minus x you can obtain that by flipping the bits of x and adding one, right? So if I have x and I wanna compute minus x, flip all the bits of the number and then add one, right? So here's zero, uh, zero, 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 one, right? So that's, the bin that's uh, equal to one. So if I wanna get negative one from that binary number, right, I'm gonna take all of these bits, right? I'm gonna flip all the zeros to ones, I'm gonna flip all the ones to zeros, so I get one, 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 zero, right? Now I wanna add one to that number there. So when you add binary numbers, it's the exact same as adding decimal numbers, 
right? You sum the two digits, and then if they, you sum the two digits, and then if you have to, you have a carry bit, right? Or a carry value, right? So here, I'm gonna have one, 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 zero, and then all zeros in a one. So add the zero and the one, you get a one, right? Add the one and the zero, you get one, and so on and so on and so on, right? And now you have the, the uh, binary number all ones, right? And if you crunch through the math, you'll realize that's equal to minus one, right? So to compute minus one, flip the bits, add one, uh, and the resulting binary number is equal to the negative of the original. Right. So one more time, here's the number 56, right? So 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, right? If I want to compute minus 56, starting from this binary value, I flip the bits, right? So 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then add 1. Now here, it, 1 and 1, right, it's not 2, right, because there is no binary digit 2, so it's zero, carry the one, right? So I now have one plus one here, and that gives you zero, right? And then one and zero is zero, and then zero and zero is, did I do that right? One and one, sorry, one and one is zero, w carry the one, one and one plus zero is zero, carry the one, one and one plus zero is zero, carry the one, right? Now one and zero is one, and then everything else is the same, right? So zero, zero, one and one. Crunch through the math, you get minus 56. Right? And similarly, you can go backwards. Right? So if I start at minus 56 and I want to get back to the 56, flip the bits, right? add 1. So 1 and 1 is 0, carry the 1. Right? 1 and 1 plus 0 is 0, carry the 1. 1 and 1 plus 0 is 0, carry the 1. Now it's 1 and then 1 and then 1 and 0, 0. Right? Again, if you look at that number there, Right, that is exactly the same as that number there, right, which was 56. So on your computer, so on your CPU, there's actually circuitry that does all of this. Right? So most, uh, modern most modern CPUs uh, actually use two's complement as the representation. There actually is circuitry on the CPU that does all of this for you. Right? Okay, so the range is asymmetric, right? We've got that, we've, uh, I think that's, I think you've figured that out by now. So the most negative value, uh, its magnitude is bigger than the most positive value. Right? Now, if you think about that for a second, um, that's gonna cause some problems, right? Because what can you do with integer values? Well, I can multiply them, divide them, add them, negate them, and things like that, right? So if I have the most negative integer value, right? So in that example right there, if I have minus two, what happens when I write minus minus two? Mm, right. Who knows, right? So it doesn't exist in this representation, right? The actual, value, the actual value of positive two does not exist, right? What happens if I take the absolute value in this case of minus two? Well, it's two, which doesn't exist in this representation. What happens when I take minus one and multiply it by minus two? Well, that's two, it doesn't exist, right? Minus two divided by minus one is two, which doesn't exist, right? So all of this stuff here, uh, there's a problem, right? If you happen to compute something with a pair of ints, right, or with a single int, uh, and that int happens to be equal to the smallest or the most negative integer value, right, you may run into a problem, right? C says uh, what happens when you do this, it says, well, we don't know what happens when you do this. That's exactly what the standard says. So in the standard, everywhere you will see, in a lot of places you will see, undefined behavior, right? Undefined behavior means exactly that. It means it's not defined what happens, anything might happen, right? So what happens when you actually run this program? So here I'm gonna start out with the smallest uh, signed character uh, value, right? So that's gonna be, let me show you the actual source code because the source code's commented. Okay, so I'm gonna start out with this constant called scar min, right? Scar min is the smallest or the most negative uh, signed character value, right? And it turns out that's minus 128, right? And I'm gonna print out that value, right? Then I'm gonna compute minus C, which doesn't exist. So let's see what we get when that happens, right? I'm gonna compute the absolute value, which doesn't exist. I'm gonna multiply it by minus one. The result doesn't exist. 
I'm going to divide by minus 1, the result doesn't exist. Right? So what happens on my computer when we run this? Uh, what is this? This is twos. Right? So it turns out on my computer, right, when I take a negative number uh, and what do I do to it? And negate it, uh, sometimes I get back a negative number. When I take the absolute value of a number, sometimes I get back a negative number. If I take a negative number and multiply it by minus 1, I get back a negative number. Right? And if I take a negative number and divide it by minus 1, I get back a negative number on this computer. Right? Uh, anybody else using Linux, you'll get the same result. I don't know what happens on Mac. I'm assuming you get the same result. The standard says you can't rely on the result. Right? You can get back anything. Um, but here you've got the case where Negative, uh, the negative of a negative value is also negative, right? So this breaks one of the, I guess, rules of mathematics, right? So in other words, arithmetic on your computer uh, is not the same as arithmetic in mathematics, right? Every once in a while, you get an incorrect result. Right? Notice that you don't get an error, right? Notice that there's nothing here that indicates that something funny has happened. You just get the result. Okay, what time is it? All right. Floating point values. So floating point values in C uh, behave exactly the same as they do in Java. Right? So that's nice. If you want to know what the minimum and maximum values and what the value of infinity is and what the value of nan is, those are all stored in float.h. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, infinity and nan are stored in math.h. Why they split them up, I don't know. Right? But they are split up. Um, and math.h, that's where you're going to look for all, uh, not all, any of the standard mathematical functions, right? So anything that you would have used in java.lang.math, you would probably find in math.h in C. Right? Uh, with the unusual, uh, with the unusual exception of ABS, the absolute value function, if you want the absolute value of an integer, that's in standard lib. Again, I don't know why they split it up. It's just the way it is. Right? Okay, so your functions in C, well, square root computes the square root of a double value. Uh, pow is the same as uh, math.pow in Java. So power of a double value raised to a double exponent. Right? Fmax is a floating point maximum, so the maximum of two double values. Right? 1.2 in, in this, right? Um, if you're using float, the names of the functions are different. Uh, so where is here? Is going to let me do that? Here we go. Okay. So this is, no, this is standard. Okay. Uh, is this right? F max. Yes, this is right. Okay. So let's look at pow, uh, yes, pow. All right, so there's, notice that when you look at the functions, there's three different versions of them, right? So there's a version called pow, which is the one I showed you. There's one called pow f and there's one called pow l. So if I click on them, right, you'll see that pow, that's the one that takes in a double and a double and returns a double, right? Pow f takes in a float and a float and returns a float, right? And pow l takes in a long double and a long double and returns a long double. Right? So if you're working with float, all the functions are the double names plus an f. Right? Now the reason you have to do this in C is because there's no function overloading in C. Right? So in C, your program can have a, uh, all your function names have to be unique in a, in a C program. Right? Whereas in Java and I think Python, you can overload function names as long as they have different signatures. Right? But you can't do that in C. Right? And so you're going to see all of this strange repetition of all the functions. Right? So there's a square root that works with doubles, there's a square root f that works with floats, and there's a square root l that works with long doubles. Right? Uh, so that's something you have to watch out for. Okay, if you want to print out a double value, a floating point value, you use the conversion uh, percent f when you use printf. Right? Uh, now, where did that program go? Okay, so 
here. Uh, this is, oh, where'd it go? You car. Sorry. Math demo. Okay, so percent %f will print out a floating point value. Now when you do so, right, so when you actually run this program, it doesn't print it out the same way that uh, Java does or Python. Right, so when you print out the values, uh, you only get six digits. Right, actually I shouldn't say you only get six digits. You always get six digits after the decimal place. Right, so notice that when it prints out the value two, it doesn't print out two, right, you get two point zero, 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 right? You get six digits after the decimal place, right? When you print out 5.7, you get an extra five zeros on the end, right? And so that's the way that printf works, right? By default, it prints out six digits after the decimal place, right? So those digits are called the precision, right? So the default precision for printf is six digits to the right of the decimal place. Now you can change that if you want to, right? So the way you change that is you write percent, period, some integer value than the f, right? So for example, percent 12f, right, will print out 12 significant digits after the decimal place, right? Percent 2f will print out two significant digits after the decimal place. Percent 1f will print out one significant digit after the decimal place, and I believe it always rounds, right, when it prints out the digits, right? So printing stuff out in C is not the same as printing stuff out in Java, right? In Java or Python, when you print out a float, um, something magical happens, right? And you get a nice number of digits after the decimal place, right? Either you get them all or you get a limited number. Um, for example, when you print out 0.5, you only get 0 0.5, right? In C, you get to specify how many digits you want, but there's no way to get the nice, uh, the nice output that you would get in Java or Python. Okay, when you go to compile this program, uh, you have to do something a little bit different than we do normally. Okay, so I'm gonna compile this program. Uh, I'm gonna recompile it again. So I'm gonna do, so this is how you would compile it. Um, this is how we compile every other program we've compiled so far, right? So compile mathdemo.c into the execu executable program mathdemo. So if you do that, it's gonna complain, right? So if you ever see this error here, right, where this command LD fails, right, it's because uh, we run into a linking problem here. So LD is the uh, GNU linker, right? So remember, that's the last stage of the compilation process. And if you keep on reading the error message, it says there's an undefined reference to PAL, right? And the reason this is happening is because pow is defined in a library that's not the one that's automatically linked to your C program, right? So pow turns out to be defined in a math library called math, not surprisingly, right? So when you're compiling a program that's using most of the functions in math.h, you have to tell the compiler what library to link against, right? So here, you have to put in minus lm, right? That's an L. Right, that's an L. So minus L tells you uh, tells the compiler to link to a speci to a specified library. Right. M is the short form for the math library. Right. So when you compile it that way, everything happens and you can run your program. Right. So there's an example of where you have to link to a external library that's not the standard one that's linked to by GCC. Right. It's very common in a large C program that you're linking to many different libraries. You have to specify all of those when you compile the program. Right? I don't know what um, Visual Studio Code will do if you have the C tools installed. I don't know if it links automatically for you when you compile and run. Okay, so there is a description of what minus LM does. Right? Okay, any questions um, about today's lecture? All right, uh, that's it for today. I'm gonna get your, mid, uh, your quizzes back to you on Monday, right? So come to class on Monday and pick up your quiz. Um, the mark should be entered by Sunday night. <laughs>